our passage where it goes today, and we're going to walk out of here. Everyone is going to be one of two kinds of people. Either you're going to be a stomach person or a heart person. So we're going to look at that today, and you're like, what are you talking about? Well, let's just read the Bible and let it tell us what we're talking about. Okay, here we go. Starting in verse 1 of, of Mark 7, verse 23. Then the Pharisees, everybody read out loud, and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when he saw some of his disciples eat bread with the fire, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees, all Jews, do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there were many other things which they have received in bowl, like the washing of the cups, pictures, coffee, vessels, and couches. The Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples would not walk according to the tradition of the elders? But he read the unlocked hands. And he answers and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips. Their hearts is far from me, and in vain they are worship me, teaching me as doctrines the commandments of men. Laying aside the name of God, you hold the tradition of men, watching the pictures, cups, and any other such things you do. He said to them, All too well you reject the command of God, that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother. question gets us into the context of what's happening. Why was opposition to Jesus Christ increasing? We see this increasing amount of opposition to Jesus. He's gaining popularity. He is gaining a lot of popularity. That's exactly right. He was calling out the religious leaders of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Started to, started to clash with <clears throat> And you would think it'd be the opposite. You think, wow, finally, the rabbi of rabbis is here. Finally, the answer to all of our prayers, which he was the answer to all their prayers, is arrived. But no, there's a major conflict. And their jealousy of his popularity. The jealousy is coming. That's a great point. Someone said something over here. In the first verse, it says the Pharisees, the Pharisees and some of the scribes came to him having come from Jerusalem. 
these are the main men now coming because he is attracting so much attention. And they're coming to where he is. Yeah, the scribes, these were the experts in law. The scribes were the scholars. They, they're the ones that the Pharisees, Sadducees, all these people consulted the scribes on what does the word teach? On what, what's going on? And, you know, and, and, and how do we make sense of all this? So they are coming, there's a committee of them coming on this inspection journey to check out this northern rabbi. And who is this guy? What is he saying? And what are all these miracles going on, priest? So the hearts of men are being displayed. The evil hearts are going to be evil, and the evil is going to ramp up because that's Satan's plan. But God reminds us as believers in Ephesians 6 there's two covers of the heart there's the shield of faith, and there's the blessed breastplate of righteousness. So God considers our hearts so valuable that he talks about the stomach and the source of defilement. But keep in mind, there is a major vein from the stomach to the heart. So if something is defiled, eventually it reaches the heart. We know as believers, God purpose, but he protects us twice in Ephesians 6 with two pieces of heart. I like that. That's going to take me a while to digest, too. Rick, uh, you got something, too. Go, man. Yeah, all their traditions. Yeah. And what's fascinating... This is what Erdman says about this period. The first period of Jesus' ministry in Eastern Galilee revealed a striking contrast between the sudden popularity with the masses and the growing opposition of the religious leaders. The second period was marked by the same popularity, and it closed with the rejection of Jesus by his townsmen in Nazareth. Remember he goes home? Remember that earlier on? In Mark 5, he, you know, prophets without honor his own country. He goes home, he's rejected. And then the third cycle, you have this... This period where there's this popularity of Christ and the confidence in him at the very height. And this is kind of toward, now Christ is getting in two years or so into his ministry, and the conflict is becoming ever more bitter. And here you have Christ feeding thousands of people, healing multitudes of people, and the scribes, the Pharisees, come from Jerusalem, rather than finding fruit... And all the evidence of this, they find fault. And they find fault in the most minuscule, absolute, ignominious, irrelevant thing. They find fault in uh, Jesus and his disciples washing their hands. A little trifle. So, that's what's going on, and that's why this opposition is increasing. And this is a pivotal time in the ministry of Christ. And we're going to see also, here's what else we're going to see. A pivot in his ministry toward the Gentile world. Next week we're going to meet the Syrophoenician, Kaleem knows what that means, woman. We're going to meet her and the Gentiles, that thing that Jesus says that folks often use to turn the scriptures and abuse it about the crumbs of dogs. Well, we're going to find out what that means next week. And, and, and there's going to be a lot more of that as we get closer to to the whole, Jesus' whole thing. So, um, yeah, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes were making mountains out of molehills. And this is a great thing, my fellow. This is, here was one who could walk on the raging deep, and they found fault. Here was one who could feed the people by the thousands with the next, next to nothing, they found fault. Here was one who went about doing good and never spoke as any man ever spoke, and yet they found fault over a trifle, over the failure of few of his disciples to properly wash their hands before eating something that transgressed their, their traditions and their rules. So they found fault. Now, so, so look at the scripture, guys. Look right here, everybody. The Pharisees that came together to him having come from Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. Now, verse, everyone say they found fault. <laughs> they found fault. So I just want to stop there. Now, let me ask you a question. I'm a, my, the answer for me is yes. Are you a fault finder? Yes. Who else has the spiritual gift <laughs> of finding faults, finding problems? So before we pounce on the scabs and the parasites here, okay? It's the critical spirit. The critical spirit. Well, and, and others or yourself? <laughs> yeah. Different, you know? different gift. <laughs> finding fault. We're all, we all have that tendency, don't we? 
We all have a, we all got a little bit of, we got a little splinter. Some of us it's a toothpick, some of us it's a daggum light pole right in our eye, okay? And we find fault, and by nature we do that. And I'll tell you, the, the, the most spiritual among us are, the, are often the most guilty, the most religious, okay? We're going to get into that, religious versus spiritual. Heart versus stomach. These guys who are obsessed with the stomach, Jesus came in and talked about the heart. And so they found fault. And so here's what's interesting. Verse 3 and 4 are not in Matthew 15, the Matthew account. Why? Because Mark is writing to a, a largely Roman Gentile audience. And they didn't understand all this ceremonial stuff. They didn't understand the, the, the rites of cleansing that were employed in the Levitical system and then added by the extra-biblical tradition that was not in the Bible. They didn't understand that. So what does Mark do? He explains it. And it's also for our benefit here, right? Uh, currents, currents way down the downstream here in the, you know, 2,000 years later. So for the Pharisees and all the Jews, do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way. Holding the tradition of the elders. Again, holding the tradition of the elders. Let's say according to Scripture. When they came from the marketplace which is an interesting thing. They do not eat unless they wash. Why not? Everybody, come on. Germs. Yeah. What's in the marketplace? Yeah, let me let me, let me me say this. Let me change that. What? Who is in the marketplace? The Gentiles. Gentiles. They came in contact with Gentiles. Politicians do. Politicians. <laughs> I knew when someone would say that. <laughs> germs. Parasite. Yeah, germs. Parasite. Germs. Wash. Remember the shaking the dust off your feet that Jesus talked about? <clears throat> which was a Jewish tradition when leaving a Gentile area. Okay, it wasn't just because they rejected the message. You know, Jews that knew nothing about the message, that, weren't, that were superficial, not even true followers of Jesus, not even true followers of God, would shake their dust off. Why? Because they came in contact with Gentiles. They were unclean. Right, Hoover? Yeah, yeah. They were also, the thing is that the scribes, and they were attacking Jesus by attacking his disciples. They were attacking his, they were calling him, the people were calling him a rabbi, a teacher. And the people would have, then they looked at the followers to find out about the rabbi. Yep, very good. And by the way, uh, chapter 6, I believe verse 56, talks about how Jesus was healing. Remember all these people came from everywhere, from all the towns and from all the villages and from all the marketplaces. Jesus, they look at the contrast. The, the, the Pharisees were obsessed with leaving the marketplace and washing. Jesus was, was obsessed with infiltrating the marketplace and touching unclean people and healing them. <coughs> what a remarkable thing. What a beauty. He would go. What they called unclean and ran from and they forbade and they condemned and they shamed those people and put them off. Jesus Christ went to that leper and touched them. Jesus Christ went in to the dirtiest and he touched them. And they touched him as in the case of the one with unclean you know, skin condition. And then thousands touched him, just the hem of his garment. So you have, they do not eat unless they wash. Look at verse 4. And there were many other things which they had received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Who, know what is, who knows what a couch is? <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know either. So don't ask me that, okay? Don't ask me what that is, okay? Please. Thank you. All right. But all these things, there's... They're, they had created thousands of words, page after page, of voluminous writings on how to wash ceremony. Not from the Holy Spirit of God, not from the, the mouth of God and the finger of God on the commandments to Moses. No, this was extra biblical. Everyone say extra biblical. This was tradition. Everyone say tradition. So they had created these traditions. And so the Pharisees. Verse 5 after Mark gives us this kind of parenthetical explanation to the Gentile readers, hearers. He comes back in verse 5 with an explanation a little more. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him. This is directly. We know they're upset now. They ask him, uh, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with one unwashed hands? Hey, but, go ahead. Yeah. Steve, yeah. Tim. What's count? That's I a great question. Yeah, I knew someone would ask that. Okay. I know you know that. I know the yeah. whole thing. See, man, we're going to do a five hour seminar tonight on what the Hebrew word for couch is. The Greek word. Okay. I want you to be in the front. I don't need five hours. 20 bucks ahead. So, 
here you have an interesting statement that I want to, uh, how far they went with tradition. By the way, what's wrong with tradition? Anybody, everybody, what's right with tradition? Tradition can be real good. By the way, it's okay. Is it okay to wash hands? Yes. Yeah. Yes. We all got a we all got a PhD in hand washing, right? Over tw in 2020, when that uh, that little virus dropped on dropped, uh, dropped on by, didn't we? Yeah. And so, hand washing, we learned how to fist pump. You know, if the Pharisees and the disciples just fist pop, they wouldn't have this. This might not even be a scripture. Think about it. Elbow pop. Yeah. So. How about chest bump? By the way, I hurt my knuckle playing basketball, my finger, and so fist bumping's been kind of hard, so I've been kind of trying to do it different, but anyway, speak to you had something. Yeah, I mean, quite frankly, the the fact that they were guided originally to wash is a testimony of God. This is way before COVID. This is way before they understood what germs were. They were just being obedient because he didn't want to spread germs. That was that was from God. But the, here's the thing. They got so caught up in the ceremonial stuff because that made them the star of the show. And Jesus comes making God the star of the show, and all the all that he's done with miracles is, is undermining everything that puts the attention on themselves. Yeah, so there's some wonderful yeah. tradition, hand washing. There's a reason there's a hand wash basin in, in this restroom in here, okay? Good to wash your hands for you. The Jews practice that. And likely the disciples had washed their hands, but they hadn't gone through the ceremonial cleansing that was like the 2.0 washing that the traditions of the elders had set up. And that's what upset them. Of all these things, they were upset by that. And so, how can something that's good, a tradition of hand washing, go bad? That's the question. Any examples? Only think about traditions that can, can, go, can, can go south really quick. Go ahead. So, I look at this as a great teaching moment for us because Satan didn't attack through the Romans at first, he attacked through the religious community that wanted or claimed to want to love God. And we can be the same way today. We've always done things this way, is how we say it, instead of the tradition of elders. And we can't have this kind of music. We have to have this kind of service. We can't do that event. We've never done that before. And we get stuck in our ways. And we say, we've got to do it the way we did it before, because that worked when I was a kid, or what, however we want to count it. And it can be the version of the Bible we use. It there you can go. be the time we go to church. It can be all kinds of different things that are extra biblical that we put on the same level as the word of Christ in our mind. And that's the thing that we attack instead of looking at the, the good of Great point. And word, our, tradition. Word. How can tradition be very good, but how can tradition be also damning and bad and get outside the word? Caleb, okay, quick. The, the problem is me. And the problem is you. And the problem is that we live in a fallen world, and if you're not saved, you have a fallen nature. Period. And so anything, period, that whether it's the word of God or otherwise, humans are going to act, and if they're acting on the guidance of their fallen nature, they're going to do evil. And evil compounds evil. You can do something for good and have the wrong reason. What he's about to quote is Isaiah the prophet. One of the roles of the prophet was to rebuke the fallen nature of the people of Israel in the Old Testament. Everyone knows what Nathan said to David, okay? That is a role of the prophet. That's a role that God had given. And he quotes Isaiah to them who know him. They're the teachers. And he says, you hypocrites. Why? Because man looks at the upward appearance. Man looks at, oh, you're washing. Oh, the Lord looks at the heart. And then the tragedy is that he sees their hearts and he knows they're fallen and he's going to die on the cross for them. And when he's dying, he says, Father, forgive them. Well, in fact, if anyone popped up that said they're a prophet or a rabbi, 
The scribes, the Pharisees, were tasked with going and putting that false prophet away. They could have been misleading Jews away from God. Yes. You know, so there was a role for that. But here they had gotten so far and so excessive. What one scholar, you know, Phillips in his commentary on Mark says, looking in a mirror became forbidden on the Sabbath. And for some of you guys, it's probably a bad idea anyways, but I'm not going to go there. Thanks. Because if you looked in the mirror on the Sabbath day and saw a gray hair, you might be tempted to pull it out, thus performing work on the Sabbath. You could also not wear your false teeth. If they fell out, you have to pick them up, and you would be working. You, if you, you could not carry a burden. So if you wanted to blow your nose downstairs, you couldn't carry a handkerchief down on the Sabbath. You'd have to tie it around your neck, go down that way, and then blow your nose downstairs. If you, uh, This is a real dilemma here. A rabbi debated about a man with a wooden leg. If his home caught on fire, could he carry his wooden leg out of the house on the Sabbath? There's a little dilemma there, okay? If someone spit on the Sabbath, you had to be careful where it landed. If it landed on the dirt and you scuffed it with your sandal, you'd be cultivating soil and thus performing work on the Sabbath. So you better watch that. Uh, and I'm coming to your house Saturday, guys, okay? Because I'm tired of that sin. <laughs> Pharisees coming out today. So you think about it, they had added layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of stuff. Offensive, offensive, offensive. So Jesus confronting, and there's something that's going to come out today. Tradition, and then there's a thing called traditionalism. And traditionalism is the route they had taken, which is essentially the worship of tradition. When that thing that you do every week, I don't know why I do it, I just always done it, becomes an idol or becomes bigger than God. And you put God's word aside, and that traditionalism, that tradition becomes bigger. And that's what had happened with these guys. So uh, so let's keep reading through this. So, so Jesus said to them, he answered them. He said, well did Isaiah... Isaiah's prophecy prophesy of you uh, hypocrites. Calls them hypocrites. Everyone say hypocrites. 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 This word is used only once in the Gospel of Mark, right here. It's used 13 times in the Gospel of Matthew. What does the word hypocrite mean? <clears throat> yeah. Says one thing to another. What else? I mean, literally, the Greek word means. Two a dual personality or two face, two people. It's, it's, it goes, and they would be very familiar with that area. You go to a play, someone comes out with a mask on. They're playing this role. They go backstage, they come out with a different mask on. So they're, they're two different people. So the word's not always derogatory when it's talking about a thespian, an actor, an actress performing on stage. But he's saying this in a derogatory, tragic way when he's quoting Isaiah the prophet about their behavior as hypocrites, as being two-faced. And so, Jesus comes down hard on them, and he follows that up by telling us to them directly what a hypocrite is. This people honors me with their lips. Now stop right there. Strong and worshiping God with our lips. David said, with my mouth, I cry out to the Lord. You know, I called upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Over and over again. But he says, this people honor me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. So there's something going on coming out, but the heart is far from him. And so we're, now we're going to mention, we're going to hear the heart a lot. And this is another statement along those lines from Isaiah. And in vain, they worship me. Everyone say, in vain. in vain. In vain. They worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So effectively saying, this is from God. This is, this behavior is how, this is how you are to live your life. I can't find a verse in the Bible to back it up, but this is, this is my conviction, and so now I'm making your conviction, which is legalism. Who knows what legalism is? We throw that word around a whole lot. Anybody, everybody. Okay, a works-based righteousness. Okay. It's a works-based behavior driven. You behave, God likes you. You misbehave, God doesn't like you. Okay? Legalism. What else is it? 
rules. It's, it's man-made rules. And we get into a whole lot of things of Christian liberty in areas, and this could, we could be here all day. If I just pick music, for example, we could have a little debate. This side of the room, you know, it's going to say music, Christian music has got a beat, is that the devil? This side of the room is going to say, you're the devil for saying that, and I'm going to get out of the way. It's going to be a monster burger right here breaking out in Dario. We don't want that. But the, the, the rules of legalism, and so, um, so Jesus says, your teaching is doctrines, things that are not biblical, the things that are God's word, you're teaching as truth, things that are the commandments of men. Verse, verse 8. Laying aside. Everyone say laying aside. Laying aside. We're laying aside the commandment of God, you hold to the, to the tradition of men. And this is what happens. You better say, open your Bible. Everyone say, open your Bible. Open your Bible. You better back it up and get in the word with it. And that's why I put this question here, this next question. How are their tradition made the word of God of no effect? Well, in the great example is how they violated the fifth commandment. Look at this. <clears throat> uh, he said, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other things you do, verse 9, he said to them, all too well you reject. You reject. It's a rejection. See, remember, they never came out. They would never say we reject God's word. They would never say we don't believe God's word. You know, pastors would never say, oh, I, I believe God's word is all authoritative. Okay? But the question is, do you teach God's word? Do you open the word of God and do you teach it as God wrote it to be taught? This is what it says, observation. This is what it means by what it says, interpretation. This is what it means to the church of Philippi, application. This is what it means to us, application. So, so it... it Tradition, when it creeps in and takes the place of the Word of God, it's always very subtle, and it's always very deceptive. And it's never, it never says, with its lips, it always professes to believe the Word of God. It always professes to be about it, but then out of its mouth comes tradition and rules and all such. So here you go. So here's what Jesus is saying, how they did it. Here's how they did it, gang. Verse 10. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother. And he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father and mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban. Everyone says Corban. Say it. Corban. Corban. And so Mark, to the Gentile audience, tells them what Corban means. It's a common Hebrew, common Hebrew term, but they wouldn't have a clue what it meant. It means a gift from God. So you guys know what's going on here. <clears throat> so here's how they use their tradition. To get out of support in mom and dad. Any of you caretake your older parents? Yes. Okay, Steve and I just buried our dads, you know, the last, you know, months or so. Uh, you take care of mom and dad. So they created a tradition called Corbin. So here you have this young man and his family, and times are tough and money's tight. Mom and dad are getting sick. Mom and dad need a lot of help, a lot of money, a lot of caretaking. And they put a tradition together that said, if you just simply say, Corbin, mom and dad say, hey, son, we need to eat. If you say, hey, listen, I've given it all to God. I've dedicated all of these reasons. They're his. And by, by their tradition, by their tradition and their rules, extra biblical rules, they could literally say, <clears throat> they could keep that asset. They could keep that money in the bank and say it's dedicated to God, they could live off that money, they could invest that money, they could use that asset, asset saying, because one day when I die, it's all going to go to God. It's a cop-out to not take care of mom and dad. A direct violation of the fifth commandment. And that's what Jesus jumps right to here, to show the, the damnable heresy of their tradition. Go, priest. God is setting up perfect order. God first, family second, and then everything else third. And when we forget that, when man creates a law, they never yeah. So, um, so this is how they violated the fifth commandment, <clears throat> and and the and, you know and Jesus reminds them, he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. That's right out of God's word. So you're in, you are you are borderline, uh, you know, threat. You're threatening yourself with. 
the death penalty by the very word of God you claim to, to teach and espouse. So, verse 12, then the, you no longer let him do anything for his mother or father. Verse 13, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down. And many such things you do. So, Jesus exposes them, and he exposes them on this thing with parents. By the way, your view of God's word will show up in your family life. <laughs> So, if you truly have a high view of God's Word, it will impact how you live. It will impact how you treat the people that are closest to you. It will impact your marriage. It will impact your children. And here they had gotten so far away from God's Word, and they had gotten so obsessed with their own man-made traditions, that they were even let, willing to let mom and dad get kicked to the curb in the name of their man-made traditions. That's how bad it had gotten. And Jesus exposes them right here. So, so I put this question here, where does defilement come from? Let's jump in together. Verse, uh, verse 13, making the word of God of no effect. Verse 14, when he called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me. Everyone say, hear me. Hear me. Hear me. Listen to Jesus. So important. He says it all over the place, doesn't he? He who has ears, let him hear. He's going to say that again here. Everyone, and understand. Verse 15, there is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him. <clears throat> but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. And then he says again, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So I put this question here. Where does the defilement come from? Now weigh your words carefully here, sirs, because our entire culture and our entire psychology culture of this country and most of the world says that you are born good and that you got to get the good to come out of you. You are created, everyone's created good, little children are, are inherently good. And mom and dad just have to get that genius out of them. And you are to love yourself. And every bit of your potential is wrapped up. You're like a little acorn and it's all going to come out into a mighty oak tree. Uh -uh. So, the, so now the Word of God says something different. A.K.A. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, which can be quoted by someone. Somebody, come on, has got to quote Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart. And when you raise that little beautiful baby, when he comes out, and I didn't say it, but I know who did. You've got a little rattlesnake there. You've got a rattlesnake. Okay. You Tony. don't have a baby. You've got a rattlesnake. So, <laughs> you don't have to teach children how to be bad. Anyone ever had to teach their kid how to lie, how to grab? Never had to teach my daughters how to grab their in a pool, grab by the hair of the other daughter's Barbie doll. Mine. You ever? You don't have to teach the words mine. You don't have to teach the words no. The words I hate you. It all comes natural. Romans three twenty three. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The entire Bible, the entire Christian worldview, is predicated on man being sinful, depraved, fallen. God didn't run away from us in the garden. We ran away from Him. And we're sinners. And we need a Savior. Our entire world philosophy says man is essentially good. And the Hinduism and most of the world religions say we're a new age. We're good. we gotta, we got to further evolve and develop into that beautiful little butterfly He made us you know, to be. You know, but So that's a, that's a contrary worldview. And Jesus says... From the heart comes some evil. It's going to even escalate more. Look at what he says here. <clears throat> he says, um, He entered the house and waved the crowd. His disciples asked him concerning the parable. So now they're, they're asking him about this parable. And he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach. Christ is using anatomy to make his point and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. So what's the stomach do? 
Yes, God's given us a sophisticated system of intestines, big intestines, small intestines, all kinds of digestive things in here that are the goal of which is to take that food through and then end up disposing of it, right? <clears throat> Jesus says, that's not what defiles a man. And he said, verse 20, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of man. Now listen to these, this litany of statements. Proceed. You ready for this? Here's what's in your heart. EKG is up. Oh my, this is scary. Evil thoughts. Interesting, it starts with thoughts. Every sin begins with a thought. James 1, it's very convicting. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted with God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. That lust, when it has conceived, bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is over, brings forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. So that is the, the starts of the thought. It starts with the lust. <clears throat> it starts with uh, uh, 1 John 2.16. All that is the world, what is it? The three things? The trifecta of evil within our hearts, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Right in here. So here we have evil thoughts. We have adulteries. Which is infidelity, you know, uh, with, with you know, cheating, uh, uh, infidelity to your wife. <clears throat> Adultery. We have fornication. And the Greek word is porneia, which is any kind of sexual thought or deed outside of the covenant of marriage. What else comes out of the heart? Just some little things like things like murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness. Deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So that is what comes from within. So how, t tell me this, how do we see this coming out of our heart? And how, yeah, Gar Mark, right back there. A few years ago, a little bit louder, a little bit louder. A few years ago, somebody sent me a sermon. This text is over to me. It's called Heart Surgery. Oh, wow. Old preacher, Ron Ralph, out of Lebanon, Tennessee. Speaker a little iffy, the microphone a little bit iffy, but I've listened to this sermon at least 40 times. And its basic premise is, if you're about to have real heart surgery, they got to build you up. they got to strengthen you so you can survive the surgery. However, if God is going to be a, do surgery on you, you have to look in the mirror and say, I am sick to death. Period. And I've listened to that sermon again and again and again about needing to be sick to death of our wicked heart. Such a good word. Wow. Dr. Aiken says this. He says, Jesus' words are spiritually revolutionary. He is saying that the real issues of religious and spiritual faith <clears throat> are internal, not external. <clears throat> sin always proceeds from within. Food ends up in the stomach, but sin begins in the heart. Food is eaten, digested in the stomach, and expelled. However, sin remains in the heart, and then produces all manner of defilement <clears throat> and death. The basic problem of fallen humanity is not that we, is not what we do, but who we are. Real filth and purity and defilement are inside and unseen, but eventually they will show themselves, as we see in verse 21 and 23. So it comes from the heart. The question is, how can the heart be cleansed? How can the heart be transformed? And the other question is, why do we spend so much cotton picking time on behavior modification? On changing the outside? How many people are going to have really clean hands but enter hell with a dirty heart and burn forever? And we're focused on the hands. And we're telling people in wrong lifestyles, quit, quit drinking, quit smoking, quit doing that. Just a second, pal. 
Quit doing all that stuff. We're telling them that. And all the while, if you change the outside, but don't change the heart, tell me what good is it? Someone tell me. What good is that? Tommy had something to say. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say about drinking. It says because drinking goes into a person, but it's not. That doesn't make them bad. It's not the alcohol that makes them bad. It's if you eat your wife, if you do the other things. That's what makes you bad. It's not an intake of alcohol. Yeah. It's sin. It's not sin. Well, but there's addictions to anything. People are addicted to all kinds of things. It's the heart <clears throat> before even the substance. It's the heart. And, that, that, and that's where Jesus comes in. Jamal. You have to kind of set you up for this. Um, think about the uh, scripture as a man thinks, so shall he be. So uh, you can act a certain way, but when we get it off on the highway, certain words come out. Uh, and if uh, somebody says something in a conversation that touches to a nerve, we might lash out. So if we change our thinking, we change our outputs, we change our reaction. That's up me out and change who I am. And then we're always about being watched. Somebody will see you giving hand signals and hand gestures on the highway. Especially if you have that. Very good. It starts in the mind, the heart. Very good. Mind change, transformation of heart. Go. This is resonating with me, this whole thing. We are physical beings, spiritual beings and physical bodies. And Jesus focused on the spiritual. I've got a younger brother who's a cardiologist with the Sanger Heart Clinic, Tops in the Southeast. He had a huge heart. I knew he'd be a great cardiologist, but he can only help me physically. Only Jesus can help me in my spiritual heart. Amen, amen. Amen. That's so good. That is so good, man. Go ahead, preacher. Well, I'm going to probably stir things up. Here we go. Here we go. If we take the, the mindset that this works okay, drinking alcohol, and we can put it in there, and we can take drugs, we can do alcohol, we can do all that. Again, I'm sorry if I offend anybody, this works has absolutely nothing about alcohol. Yeah. It's about whether you're talking about the heart or the stomach. That's absolutely I'm right. Sorry yep. if I offend anybody, yeah. but too many people yeah. have taken this verse and justified drinking alcohol, yeah. doing drugs, right. and you can have anything else in there. Yeah. As long as I don't let anything bad come out, it's okay what I put in there. Right. And that is not biblical, and that is not right. Yep. So yeah. And I think that's what the confusion about this gentleman's comment over here. Uh, you know, uh, you know, so this verse is not in any way, shape, or form justifying any kind of abuse, substance abuse, or intake of that. What it is saying is the way that you change the way the alcoholic is transformed is by changing the heart. You know, so take away the liquor, he's going to be dry, but his heart's going to go chasing after something else. Right? All our hearts. John Calvin said the heart is like an idol factory. We're constructing and we're we're creating all these idols constantly. It's our heart, you know, and so very good word right here. The whole thing is we cannot uh, obtain Christ-likeness through human effort. Mm -hmm. We cannot do it yeah. through human attainment. Uh, when Jesus left, or before he left, he said, I'm leaving so someone can come, the Holy Spirit. And he said he would lead us, he'd be our guide. We went to Israel a year and a half ago. We had a guide from the time our plane landed until we left and came back to the U.S. And we would have been lost. We might have thought we knew the right place. But we didn't. There's a way that seems right to man, and that way leads to death. So the idea here is, and Psalm 19 says this, who can discern their own errors? <clears throat> we can. You know, you can, I, we had council leaders sit in our home, elders in the church. There was a man and a woman about 20 years ago that came to us, and their, their marriage was fractured. He was an elder in his church. I named the church, you would know the church that, that he was an elder in. 
He knew the Bible frontwards and backwards. He could quote a chapter and verse. And he was one of the most confusing men I've ever seen because he would browbeat his wife with the scripture. It was bereft of the Holy Spirit. So we have to have the Spirit to be our guide. And we have to leave room when we're reading the Word. He wants to lead us into all truth, but a lot of that truth is the truth about us and what's going on in uh, us. Very good word. Yeah, I have ahead. a question somewhat pertaining to this. Yep. I would like to, we've got many, many ministers in here. Mm -hmm. When you, when God lays a sermon on your heart, or when you think that He's laid a sermon on your heart, you get up and you practice that. You may be in front of a mirror or whatever and practice your, your sermon. How do you know deep down inside if, if these are the words that God wants me to use? Somebody answer me, please. How do what God is saying to you? Yeah, Clean's got a good time for that. You know, we're going to bring it down to a microphone. Yes. Nobody think I'm not. To the what? The bottom line is we need to translate what we know about the Bible and to, you know, that goes down into our heart and we start putting our hands in it. Had knowledge like these guys did to them as they make them look good, but really in their faith, you know, they didn't trust them on God. The way we right. have to be trusting the same way. Trusting on God to take steps and to faith and faith. Like financials, you know, the, the financials. So we gotta trust the Lord about our finan financial yes. about the, our <coughs> neighbors and the people around. The pastor, you know, like we need to step out. The world is is just it's getting destroyed, you guys. It's just getting destroyed. It's waiting for us to mobilize, to come out, you know, and to start starting with the neighbors, you know, and around the city, around this North America, and around the world. Amen. 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 But Tony, to short answer your question, God wrote a book. It's called the Bible. So these guys are opening that book and they're studying. And they're saying, God, show me your word. I'm going to feed your word to your people. So there's the answer to your question. Look at the three damnable statements about what these religious leaders did in their excess. They abandoned the commandment of God, verse 8. They rejected the command of God, verse 9. They set aside or they nullified the word of God, verse 13. So when you start doing that, you get away from what God's word says. You're just a bunch of, it's a TED talk, honestly. It's let's read a verse and let me just give you my opinions and tell you some cool stories and stuff. And this is what one guy said. This is really, really strong here. He says, look, the Jews elevated their traditions above the Torah. They substituted their oral law, and it's endless haggling over minutia and its burdensome rules and regulations for the word of God. They set aside the magnificent spiritual concepts of the Old Testament and taught the people to be preoccupied with pots and pans and all their endless rules regarding not seeding a kid and its mother's milk and all this nonsense. The heart of unregenerate man always seems to lean in the same direction. The Roman Catholic Church cherishes the same love for the traditional teachings of the fathers, as do the Jews. Romanism is concerned with feasts and fasts, pilgrimages, penances, robes and rituals, icons and images, purgatory, stuff that's not even in the Bible. The simple truth of the Word of God is buried beneath it all. Let's pick on the Protestants. Not, all, not, not that Protestants are much better. Phillips, this is from Phillips' commentary. We develop our own outward forms of traditions. People can remain in our fellowship as long as they conform to our little rituals. See? All these little do's and don'ts, all these little legalistic rules. That is often all we expect of them. But Christianity is not a matter of foot washings, head coverings, infant baptisms, and such things. Judging by the zeal with which their advocates defend these things and insist on them, one would think that, it was, that that's all there is to being a Christian. Jesus said, you reject the commandment of God by keeping your own traditions. <clears throat> This is where legalism always ends. Our creeds become more important than God's commandments. Our interpretations based on human cleverness are more important than the illumination of the Holy Spirit. God's law ceases to be a standard. It becomes a system that we manipulate to control until our traditions and teachings take the place of God's word. Okay, so we're going to fall in with our traditions, our traditionalism, and the stuff we've always done that we think, or we're going to fall in with God's word. 
That's why you preach the Word. So that's why it becomes crystal clear. Our tradition makes it real complicated. And I love what Danny Aiken says. Everybody stand up. We're done. We're out of time. We've gone way over. He says there's two appro approaches to religion. Each can be summed up in, more, in two words. Do or done. Everyone say do, do or done. done. Okay, the world says the problem is out there and the solution is to answer the question, what can I do? The Bible says the problem is inside of us, our sin nature. And the answer is what Jesus Christ has done. In legalism, we think better of ourselves than Jesus does. In salvation, we think the same of ourselves as Jesus does. We are hopeless, helpless sinners in desperate need of a Savior. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man does not see what the Lord sees, for man looks on the outward appearance. But God looks on the heart. And so, he sees, does he see in me a self-righteous legalist trusting in what I do? Or does he see in me a humble sinner trusting in what Jesus Christ has done? He said, it is finished. He did the work. Quit trying to best his work. Quit trying to add to it. Right? Rest in the finished work of Jesus. And that's the, that's the glory of the gospel. Amen. So, now tell me what is count. We'll be after about that. <laughs> Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, Colossians says. But not according to Christ. For in Christ dwells all the fullness of the body of Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. So you go to Jesus, he clears things up. Okay? So we're gonna wrap up. We're completely out of time. <clears throat> I'm gonna say this, and we'll talk afterward, and we're gonna pray with someone afterward. Everyone pray with one person before you leave. Okay? I grew up very Pharisaic. And I believe that people like I, you know, I was and still struggle, but before Christ, there's a hotter place in hell for Pharisees. Because they know it, and they judge everyone else, right, by a standard that they don't even hold themselves to. So I was I was not only unrighteous, but I was self-righteous before I found Christ. And part of that conditioning. Uh, and part of that training, and we've had some talks about this, is, you know, I used to just say, if you have a tattoo, you're a sinner. I mean, that's just, you can't be of God, you know, right? And so, and of course, you know, God had to deal with, convict me on that, and quit looking at the external. You know, and the fact is there's guys with tattoos a lot closer to God than I am, okay? And so, I'm walking through the parking lot of, uh, over here on Stratford, and I'm on speakerphone with Dr. Carson. And we're talking and we're about to pray. And there's this big old dude who looked a little bit like Cousin Brian. And yes, he was a Marine, I found out. Joseph. And he's got a big old tat, a big old cross tattoo on his throat. And now I see cross tattoos. And, and the old Stu would have said, oh, my soul. I'm, I'm going to just divert my eyes and go this way. But I had to tell him about Christian radio. Amen. And I had to share Jesus with him. And I had my share of the truth card ready. You know, I had my three or four gospel tracks based on where he was going, you know. And I know he's probably in a hurry. He just left the coffee shop. He's driving off in his big old pimped out truck. I mean, it was a nice big truck. Dude's got military fatigues. He's the kind of guy you, you want to be his friend, right? You don't want to be on the wrong side of. But he's got this tattoo. And legalistic stews thinking, man, you know, my old self would have just shunned this guy. This guy, there's poor guy on his way to hell. So I say, hey, Joe, I said, I didn't know his name at that time. I said, hey, buddy. I said, hey, I see that tattoo with a cross. I said, you might enjoy this Christian radio station. Amen. And you know what he said? He looked at me and he said, you're Stu. I listen all the time. <laughs> hey, it, it gets better because he was on speakerphone. Out of the mouth of witnesses. This is one of those times, like, I don't know if I should be talking to Carson. I don't know how it's going to turn out. He's going to knock me cold. Next thing you know, I'm talking to him. He's listening. He says he's a Marine. I said, that's crazy. My nephew has been in the Marine Corps now for four weeks. He just entered. We've been praying for him like crazy. Would you pray for him? So there, here is a guy who I would have judged and written off as chopped liver because of that external thing. Here he is ministering to me. And here he is praying with me. You were there. And I bowed my head, and you bowed your head in your home on speakerphone. And this guy prayed for my nephew Watson, a Marine, praying for another Marine. Isn't that amazing, Brian? And in that moment, he ministered. 
to me, the guy who thought, this guy needs me to minister to him. See, so we got to quit looking at the outside. Man looks at the outside. God looks on the heart. Right? That's why we hide God's Word in our heart. That's why we trust the Lord with all our heart. That's why we love the Lord our God with all our heart. And that's why we pray with David. Create in me. Say it with me. Create in me a clean heart. The Lord. The heart. Adrian Rogers said it in an incredible way. He said, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. So here's my question, guys. Whatever facade you got, whatever posing, I'm the best poser of any of them, by the way. What's going on in your heart right now? What's really going on in your heart? Like I asked my insurance agent yesterday. All the small talk was done. I did the test. That I, you know, I did renew some stuff and all that. And I said, look, everyone wants to talk about how the kids are doing, how's school, how's the lacrosse team, you know, how's business, how your travels, how your in-laws. I asked him this, how's your heart? Is your heart... Not even external. Even sometimes we get into the, well, are you attending church? Okay, well, okay, check that off. Okay, I'm going to go talk to the next guy. No. In your heart of hearts, is there a deep affection for Jesus Christ? Okay. Your first love. Are you in love with Jesus? And this is not a condemnation thing. This is a come alongside thing. Let's do the EKG and let's get with him. And some of y'all need to leave this meeting right now. You need to go get your Bible. You need to go get alone with Jesus and hang out with Him and call upon the most powerful one. Because you're in the storm looking at the storm. You're not looking at Jesus. You're not reaching out to His mighty hand to pick you up. Because what He can do inside your heart, no human being can do. No psychologist can do. No preacher can do. But that's why preachers preach the Word. Why? Because the Word of God is quick and powerful. And it gets in the heart. That's why we need God's Word, because we read the Bible. The Bible reads you and convicts your heart. And that's the beauty of it. So you can, hey, you can have hands washed by water, or you can have a heart washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, which takes away all sin. So go to Him and let, watch Him heal your heart. Watch Him transform your heart. And let me tell you something right now. You're going to walk out of here. You're going to walk in. Uh, you're, everyone you co come in contact with is going to need... A heart transformation. Okay? If they're, if they're a believer and they've drifted, they just need a little, they need to get those, one of those metal things you put on the body and pop it up. They need a jolt. They need a jolt, right? And that's why you're there, man. Let's talk to Jesus right now. Okay? You might be mad at God. He's not mad at you. He's mad about you. You don't believe in God? He believes in you. Hallelujah. Let's jolt that thing. Let's wake up. Let's turn to our first love. See? And that's the beauty of what the gospel does. And that's where we've got to get into the heart, get past those layers, get past the behavior, behavior modification, and get in the heart. So we're done. Who's going to close in prayer today? I will. Priest, come on up here, man. This guy sends the word of God out by text every morning, blesses my socks off, then I see it on LinkedIn, then I see it on Facebook, and I can't get away from it, but that's the word of God. The, the heart of man needs, right? Amen? Pray for us, brother. Heavenly Father, we love you, we seek you, and serve you. You are a mighty, magnificent, and marvelous God, and we praise you because you're worthy of it. We ask you to forgive our sins. We seek forgiveness where it's need. We ask you, Lord Jesus, watch over God and bless us today. Thank you for the message. Thank you for the messenger. We pray for the message, for the song, but also for the hearts, Lord. We heard about the heart and the stomach. So we pray, Lord, that that artery that goes from our brain to the rest of our body and that vein that returns the blood, Lord Jesus, that you will absolutely, positively put a word in our heart that we can take and go into a lost and a dying world today. We pray for each and every person we'll encounter. Father God, we pray for no car trouble, no health issues, no accidents, because we have heard the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. 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 Pray with one person before you leave.